Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation, um, CQL's webinar on supported decision making. Um, I'm delighted. My name is Kathy Adamick, and I'm delighted to announce that we have Ann Beekner, who's a quality and um, um, enhancement specialist for CQL, and Morgan Whitlatch, who's the um, with the Quality Trust in DC and has um, been a real leader in supported decision making on the call with us today. Um, you can use the question box to ask any questions about any technical things that you have going on um, or any um, questions as we're doing the presentation. Generally speaking, we'll hold the um, questions until the end and answer as many questions as we have time to answer. And so welcome to the presentation. Thank you. Kathy, if you might uh, move forward to the next slide. <clears throat> this is Ann Beekner, and I am um, thrilled and honored to have the opportunity to speak with you all about an emerging model titled Supporter Decision Ma Making. Uh, and I am most thrilled about having had the opportunity to partner with um, Morgan. Morgan has more than 15 years of experience in the disability law field, has dedicated her legal career to working with and on behalf of people with disabilities, with extensive experience in implementing systemic issues regarding to policy practice and training initiatives, including the National Resource Center on Supported Decision Making and the Jenny Hatch Justice Project. Um, we would love to be able to get started. We have a lot of things to share with you today. And um, as Kathy said, if you do have questions or comments, we please ask you for, for you to use the question box if you toggle down to the bottom of, bottom of the screen. And we will attempt to address any questions at the end of the uh, webinar. Today's agenda, if we move forward, on the slide is we're going to talk about supported decision making. So if you hear us using the acronym SDM um, that we may be using uh, throughout um, the history of supported decision making, why it is important. I'm going to be taking some time and linking supported decision making with personal outcome measures, basic assurances. We're going to talk a bit about personal and systems advocacy and what role that plays in supporting efforts around supported decision making. And um, at the end, we have a commitment challenge and some wrap up. We also will have a few polls interspersed throughout today's webinar in hopes of making it a bit more interactive for anyone. Next slide, please. For those of you who are familiar with the Council on Quality and Leadership, um, absolutely, you are probably familiar with our, our mission of quality. We believe, um, and this is why we've taken efforts to um, take a little bit more of an um, interest in and are having more recently spent more time in developing uh, webinars and trainings and conferences that involve support decision making. We believe everyone deserves dignity, opportunity, and community living. Uh, we support people and the organizations who are involved in people's lives to discover and define their own personal quality of life, which um, to me fits very much into what we're going to be talking about today. Next slide. A quick poll as we're getting started. Um, the poll that you should see in front of you uh, should read, have you personally or professionally been involved in using the supported decision-making process with a person supported? Um, and so you've been given the opportunity to answer yes or no. So if you would Please begin your voting on that. I'm going to close the poll. In five, four, three, 
two, one. Thank you. All right, so our results show that 34% of um, those that are on the webinar today um, have had some involvement using support decision making and the majority, 68 at this point, that are still learning about it, maybe not have had as much um, uh, awareness of uh, the support decision making process. So for both uh, those that have had this uh, interaction using support decision making and those who are not, we really hope that this continues for those of you who have had your continued energies and provide you with additional resources. For those that have not, we intend that this should provide you with a lot of the backdrop, a lot of the history, and some of the, the tools and or practices and resources that will support you in that. So thank you. Next slide, please. A little bit about what the supported decision making is. Um, and let's see how this might even apply to ourselves. On the screen here, it says when you're making a decision, do you typically talk to a trusted friend or family member? Do you make a list of pros or cons or sometimes get advice from a professional or someone who's had more experience than you? Next slide, please. If you've done any of these, it might be that you have applied the model of supported decision-making. So another quick poll here is for those of you who um, choose to answer, we would love for as much participation as possible. Select the one answer that in your mind right now defines supported decision-making. First checkbox, a paradigm in which people with disabilities make their own choices with assistance of family members and others they trust a tool used to help people with disabilities exercise their right to self-determination, a way of empowering people with disabilities to make their own decisions rather than appointing someone else to make decisions for them, a fancy way of saying how we all make choices or all of the above. So we'll give you a bit to respond. Okay, I'll end the polling in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so we can see from your polling that um, most of you have a great understanding already of what supported decision making is. It is a compilation of the prior four um, answers that were there. It incorporates pieces or components of those, a paradigm to support people with disabilities. It's a tool and it's a way of empowering and a fancy way of saying how we do um, make choices in our lives. So thank you for that. Um, what I'm going to do now is, is hand the webinar over to Morgan. And Morgan's gonna cover some pertinent points regarding national and international backdrop and uh, provide the expertise since she has a wealth of it for us to learn about the kind of the framework of this. So Morgan, thank you. Thank you so much, Anne and Kathy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the international backdrop to supported decision-making because one of the things that I want people to think about this as is a real international movement. Um, so one of the key points when we think about supported decision making is we think about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And, you know, that particular, um, that particular initiative um, really brought supported decision making to the fore internationally. Now, it's sometimes abbreviated as CRPD, and it's been ratified. Um, it's an international treaty by at least 162 countries. Um, and its results are ranging from development of new laws to including disability rights in national constitutions to actual implementation on the ground. And you can learn more about the convention by um, hitting the link that talks about it. But one of the reasons why I highlight this particular piece is that it brought to the fore um, certain kinds of 
issues that are immediately related to supported decision making through its Article 12. And Article 12 does a couple of things. Okay, it first sets out that people with disabilities have the right to recognition everywhere as persons before the law and to enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life. Now, it was actually the CRPD committee that incorporated into this concept the specific term supported decision making by emphasizing that to exercise that kind of legal capacity, one could use supported decision making in many different forms. It could be supporters helping the person to understand the choices at hand, actually communicating decisions to others, and even helping others realize the person with a significant disability is a person with a history, interests, and aims in life, and someone capable of exercising legal capacity. So it's actually the CRPD committee that used that phrase supported decision making, which had actually been in use in some countries, particularly Canada. It's been being used for decades. So this was kind of taking this idea of supported decision making and bringing it to the fore um, for people with disabilities. The CRPD requires state parties to take appropriate measures to provide access by persons with disabilities to the support they may require to exercise their legal capacity. Okay, so that's kind of getting to the point that people should be supported to exercise that legal right and those legal, that legal capacity rights. But there's a flip side to this too because state parties under the CRPD also have important responsibilities to provide safeguards, safeguards for people exercising that legal capacity to prevent abuse um, in the context of international human rights law. And so I think that's an important piece of this to say it's not only about rights, but it's also about safeguards and recognizing how to incorporate the safeguards as people exercise their legal rights. Next slide. So with this international backdrop, so while the United States is not among the many countries that have actually ratified the CRPD, supported decision making has been linked to some overarching aims in US law and federal policy impacting older adults and people with disabilities. And that includes the American with Disabilities Act, it includes the Older Americans Act, it includes Medicaid, okay? It's been recognized in this context and endorsed by the Administration for Community Living of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which funded the National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making. And you're gonna hear me refer a lot to this National Resource Center because it's designed to be a kind of hub of information about supported decision making in the United States. And you can actually click on certain states on www.supporteddecisionmaking.org to see what's happening in your state. Um, and see what kinds of policies, initiatives, or projects um, that the National Resource Center is aware of in your state. It's a good kind of starting point when you're thinking through how to implement supported decision making on the ground so that you're not having to recreate the wheel. It contains certain kinds of tools for actually implementing supported decision making um, that you can start as a, as a starting point. Um, it is taking, you know, I think as a result of some of this national recognition, it's taking hold within the country's disability and aging and advocacy discourse. And we're seeing changes um, in states. So there's at least 17 states in DC have introduced legislation or resolutions that refer specifically to supported decision-making. And I've listed some of those here, but what I like to highlight here, states are implementing supported decision-making differently and in various ways. There's not one kind of answer. They've taken different approaches when it comes to legislation. Some have created supported decision-making agreements, which are legal agreements that recognize that a person with a disability is supported by specific supporters to help them make decisions. Not make the decision for them, but to support them in making their own decisions. Um, in that way, supported decision-making is distinct from substitute decision-making, when someone else is making the person with a disability's decision for them. Um, so we see supported decision-making agreements in places like Texas, Delaware, Wisconsin, D.C., and Missouri. Um, other states have taken a different approach. They have said that supported decision-making needs to be recognized in the courts as a less restrictive alternative to guardianship that should be ruled out before a court would order a guardianship. So we're seeing that in New Mexico and Maine, for example. Other states are wanting studies to be done on supported decision-making, um, like Virginia, Maine, and Indiana. 
Others have kind of focused on a very specific kind of supported decision making for a very specific kind of medical decision, specifically organ transplantation. And people ask me a lot, Morgan, why are you focusing on this? Well, it's interesting in those states, which include Maryland and Kansas, where they define what supported decision making services are so that people can access uh, organs. But the more important, I think, aspect of this is that it's actually linking medical care and access to reasonable modifications to procedures in medical care so that people can get the care that they need to the American with Disabilities Act. It's saying, you know, people with disabilities can be discriminated against and we don't want that. We want to fight against that. And that's really what was the motivation between those laws, which is why I highlight that. And the other piece I highlight is there's a lot of states that are considering passing supportive decision-making legislation, and there's some that are pending. So we have some states in um, Alaska and Rhode Island right now have some legislation pending that would create supportive decision-making agreements. So we're seeing a lot of movement in states towards formally recognizing in statute um, supportive decision-making and its role in the lives of people with disabilities. Next slide. But it's not only legislation that we're seeing. We're also seeing courts recognize supported decision making. And the reason why I'm highlighting this is because you really don't need a law change in your state to implement supported decision making. And this is highlighted by the fact that courts are now more recognizing what that role is in people's lives as an alternative to guardianship or the removal of the decision making rights of somebody and the transfer of those rights to another person called a guardian. So we're seeing court orders, um, even without legislation change, in places like New York. So New York had a 2012 decision um, that came down that talked about supported decision making, also in the context of the American with Disabilities Act, as well as um, trying to promote less restrictive forms of support for people making decisions. Um, and so that since 2012, there have been other states that were seeing that. And many of these states hadn't passed legislation yet. So New York hadn't passed legislation, Virginia hadn't passed legislation, Massachusetts hadn't passed legislation, DC hadn't passed legislation. So, you know, we're really seeing a kind of movement to courts recognizing that there is this alternative and that it should be exhausted and used actually before the appointment of a guardian. Um, we've also seen projects in a number of states that are focused on trying to increase access to supported decision making. And the reason why I list here some of the states, and you can find out more information about these specific initiatives uh, at our supporteddecisionmaking.org website, is because these are projects you can reach out to to find out more about how it's being implemented so that you're not recreating the will. One of these might be even one of your states. Um, so we're seeing, for example, some focus specifically on people with de developmental disabilities in Massachusetts, in Maine, and in New York. New York is um, undergoing a five-year project, um, and it'll be over five years probably, um, focused on people with developmental disabilities to implement supported decision-making that's funded through their Developmental uh, Disability Council. And I think one of the reasons I'm excited about this New York project is it will be, um, at the end of it, one of the largest pilots um, to reach hundreds of people with disabilities. Um, and right now they're focused a lot on transition age youth um, that are exiting out of school to try to create diversion programs to prevent guardianship. So it's a really exciting time. Um, and we've seen more and more endorsements of supported decision making um, by national organiza organizations and national policy. Um, so we, I mentioned um, ACL through the U.S. Department on Health and Human Services, but we're also seeing the American Bar Association, which is basically the organization of lawyers for lawyers, recognizing supported decision making and the importance of trying to promote less restrictive alternatives to guardianship. We have the National Guardianship Association has also recognized the role of supported decision making, not only before guardianship is appointed, but after guardianship is appointed too, within the guardianship and person relationship. The Uniform Law Commission has recently redone its model law um, to specifically recognize supported decision making as a less restrictive alternative to guardianship that should be exhausted before, um, before a judge appoints a guardian. Um, and we're seeing other kind of national organizations recognize supported decision making. So this isn't a concept that we're making up. This is a concept that's gaining and is being recognized as a best practice um, in the field of disability. Next slide.
What is supported decision making, you ask? Supported decision making is a way people with disabilities, both physical and intellectual, can make their own decisions and stay in charge of their lives while receiving any help they need to do so. Throughout this video, you will meet individuals who make decisions every day with different levels of support. As you will see, many parents are advised to seek guardianship for their children when they reach the age of majority. Supported decision-making is one option on a continuum of decision-making options that enables people to gain support from important people in their lives to make informed choices. I am a um, single father of a um, Down syndrome 22-year-old daughter. Christopher has cerebral palsy. He's also considered deafblind. He is um, completely dependent on others to care for him. My mom had a stroke in 2002, and, and on top of that, she had dementia. My name is Tara Buster. I'm 34 years old, living with my, my mother. A few months after graduating high school, I was in a car accident and suffered a severe traumatic brain injury. Bridget was born five weeks premature and had some issues at delivery, um, lack of oxygen. So she um, ended up with cerebral palsy. At 18, since Anne was still in a coma after her accident, her parents chose to hold power of attorney rather than becoming her legal guardian. I have self advocacy I don't have no legal guardian. I went to a lawyer and he had told me she's not able to give permission, so we had to go to another route, and that's why I ended up going to um, guardianship. I have guardianship of Bridget, which I regret. Um, at the age of 18, in school, I was told that if Bridget didn't get guardianship and something happened to her, and there was an accident or she needed surgery, I wouldn't be able to sign for her care, and that she could die. That was totally untrue, but as a mother, thinking that I was doing the best that I should be doing for my daughter, my husband and I went ahead and got guardianship. Um, not knowing that there are other choices such as um, health care, power of attorney, um, and supported decision making, which is new. Supported decision making means to me making decisions with the support of those close to me. Support decision making, as far as is within the realm of my household, says that as a family, there are certain decisions that because of her disability, she's not going to be capable, uh, mentally capable of digesting the seriousness of it. So at that point, um, those are the times when I intervene. In my situation, having personal assistance makes independence possible for me. For our families, I think we want Christopher to always be home. So therefore, we need to make sure that we're addressing any new things that come up as he's getting older and as he needs more equipment, we need to be prepared to be able to find the way, to find the resources so that Christopher does have those supports in the home. It's a good thing because you got different options for somebody can reach out and help you. I may not think she can do it, but pass or fail, we will try because this is what, you know, support is. Support is not making decisions for that person, it's to help that person guide them in the direction that they want to go. And she'll always have someone looking after her, but she doesn't always need someone telling her what to do. She was there for me, so I should be there for her on her behalf. I, I don't think that supportive decision making is something that um, someone should have a dominance over someone this capable of doing, just because they are titled with a um, developmental delay. I make decisions at work every day. I do make dinner every night. I watch TV. I get my train of Dunkin' Donuts, and I do groceries. Everything we've done so far, we always have done it thinking in his quality of life, that the choices that we are making is going to give him a better quality of life, not what I want as a mom. 
We protect our children because we think they're going to make mistakes and they're going to get hurt. We're not giving people with disabilities the opportunities to learn from their failures. The biggest decision was, you know, removing selfishness out of it. Because when you're a parent with a special needs child, you go through a lot of different things and put yourself on a lot of different islands. So it's easy for you to say that you're making the best judgment for her, even though it's just for yourself. So to be able to critique yourself and say, listen, this is really what she wants to do. So there are little things in life that has taught me, that have taught me through the years, along with Bridget teaching me, that she doesn't always need me around. She needs the support of the community and her family. I want to be the one in the driver's seat of my own life. And if that means taking some reminders or hearing some suggestions from time to time, I'm all for it. Christopher's life matters a lot. To everybody that from taking care of Christopher to getting to know Christopher out in the community, he's very important. And people need to see him as an important citizen and that his life matters. I would like people in the non-disabled community, um, I would also like policymakers to know that Bridget has options and for people to know to give people their options. Um, we need to educate people on what there is out there and I want Bridget to just be like everyone else. I'm independent, I make my own decisions. Freedom of choice is a civil right given to us by the Constitution of the United States of America. Supported decision making allows us to make choices and have a self-directed life. Everyone has the right to make decisions, even if one needs a little support. Your support, my decisions, endless opportunities, my life, Um, as Morgan so wonderfully explained why supportive decision made the background and the backdrop to this is why it is important. It is in, it's driven in part by the United Nations, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and as pertinent to us in the United States, a, a presumption of competence, one's right to liberty, to self-determination, to personal autonomy, uh, you know, is fundamental to what our culture and what our country has been. Um, so the one of the stories that I was able to uh, take a little more time in researching was a Jenny Hatch story, which of course has a very strong connection to Morgan and to the Quality Trust. Um, but in one of the um, stories that I was researching about Jenny Hatch, um, and actually she has her own uh, website or a website supported through the Quality Trust. It's uh, the Jenny Hatch Justice Project. But there's a quote there um, from the Washington Post who quoted Jonathan Martinez and the quote reads, for anyone who has been told you can't do something, you can't make your own decisions, I give you Jenny Hatch, the rock that starts the avalanche. And a little bit more about the Jenny Hatch Justice Project, um, just to put it in a, in a nutshell, um, it is an integrated, multifaceted resource and outreach center dedicated to advancing people with disabilities' rights to make their own choices and to determine their own path and direction in life. So as well as the resources that Morgan has referenced, absolutely, if you um, search through the Jenny Hatch Project, you'll be able to link to many other of the resources that were mentioned by Morgan, as well as additional ones. Next slide, please. And I would just add one element about the Jenny Hatch Justice Project. Its namesake is a woman with Down syndrome in Virginia, who uh, ha it tells the story of how she fought to get her decision-making rights back with the help of Quality Trust using supported decision-making. And her story is probably said most powerfully through Jenny's own words when she talks about how guardianship affected her life. So she was someone who had lived in the community, 
worked in the community. Um, and then she had, a, she was hit by a car while she was riding a bike. And that was when the whole guardianship system and process seemed to start for her. Um, and it resulted in her isolation from her community. She was put involuntarily into a group home. Um, she was taken away from her friends. She was put into a segregated workshop. And um, it was through her own power and the right kind of advocacy that she was ultimately able to have her rights restored. So I really do encourage people to go to the Jenny Hatch Justice Project.org website to learn more about Jenny's powerful story. Thank you. It's good to have had your, you were up front and center to all of that. So thank you very much, Morgan. Um, some of the benefits that we really do want to talk to you about um, with regard to um, efforts in supporting the model of dis the support of decision making. And these are things that are recognized by the National Council on Disability. And at the bottom, I've put um, the publication uh, website that you can go to. And I would strongly recommend also that you get it, if you get a chance to look through that. I've been only able to pick out pieces for, you know, this could be a very lengthy type of webinar, but I wanted to highlight um, uh, some of the some of the things that stood out most to me in this, and the what they were find what they found in their um, studies is that studies have shown people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who exercise greater self determination have better life outcomes and quality of life. And just as a little bit of a teaser, a little further down in our webinar, we really do want to talk to you about um, the quality of life, better life outcomes, and that for the tools of the personal outcome measures and the tool of basic assurances through CQL are absolutely where I'm gonna spend a little bit of time in how this might link to supporting efforts for people as well as organizational act uh, actions. One of the interviewees that they quote in the study is, it's not about protecting someone, it's about teaching them how to best protect themselves, which is another great way of explaining what supported decision making offers to people. And organizationally, how do we get our minds and principles and values around that um, so that those are the efforts that we can move forward with people on in our organizational efforts. Next slide, please. Uh, in the study, uh, what was found is in the absence of supported decision-making in people's lives, um, absolutely when denied personal self-determination, people can feel helpless, they feel hopeless, self-critical, uh, their self-worth is absolutely something which is in question, and when denied self-determination, people do experience lower self-esteem, less willing to be active and to be engaged in their life, in, in their aims and aspirations, leaving people with a feeling of inadequacy and incompetency. And this, uh, we sometimes find that people who have had others making decisions for them for many, many years absolutely have sort of a learned response to uh, pleasing those who've been involved in the service delivery network from, for them. So that may also um, decrease people's abilities to function and to have awareness about how to make decisions for themselves and, and for their life aspirations. Next, please. But back to the um, UN Convention uh, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The um, things that I left with, with regard to the report um, that I referenced earlier, is this was <clears throat> pretty clear, is that the objective of people supporting the model of, of supported decision-making is really moving from pe seeing people with disabilities as objects of charity, of medical treatment, of social protection, to viewing people um, with same rights and, this, and same capabilities of claiming and exercising those rights, which lends itself very well back to what Morgan was talking about in the legalities of this. Also, um, making decisions based on free and informed consent, as well as being active members of society. And just to 
go back to a little bit about what we're talking about in informed consent is that, of course, we want people to have had um, education and experience and exposure to know what their preferences are and make an informed decision with people who have had limited life experiences how then as a challenge for organizations and support team members how do we build in opportunities for people to learn about to have experiences around and to be exposed to what we're talking about with options available to us as citizens of the united states I did want to put a shout out to um, one of our recent CQL webinars on ableism. Um, the description and the PowerPoint slides are available on the CQL website. So if you go to our c-q-l.org website and click on the tab that is for training and certification, into webinars, you will be able to find um, the title of this webinar on ableism, which really does address that object of charity of medical treatment, social protection in modern days. And the title of that webinar on our CQL website is Modern Ableism and Disability Prejudice. So if you're interested in even another look from kind of a, an, another vantage point, um, I would encourage you to take a look at that webinar as well, or the PowerPoints on that, that are available on our website. Next slide, please. Uh, the convention that Morgan talked about and that we're continuing to talk about, the approach to people with disabilities is, as it's listed here, is that people with or without disabilities have human rights um, with explicit social development dimensions, that uh, people of all types of disabilities must enjoy all of our human rights and fundamental freedoms, which of course, getting back to those of us who are living and working and residing in the United States is you know, one of the, our basic tenets of um, how our country was built. Um, areas where rights have been violated and protection of rights must be reinforced, which is really wonderfully reinforcing to hear that not only legislatively but also in courts from Morgan's portion is that courts are saying possibly gosh we need to take a step back and ensure that all other lesser types of restricted support alternatives have been looked at I don't know that's not across the board but it is movement absolutely in the right direction so that other types of alternating alternative supports for people are looked at prior to uh, the imposition of guardianship. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit of an example, and, and I'm sure Morgan, if you have awareness of this, uh, this lady as well, would love for your input. Suzanne Heck, who um, in all the articles I read about her prefers to be called Susie, um, at the age of 18, became a ward of the state of Kentucky. And um, through her raising the issue and raising her awareness with those in, in her team, contacted Kentucky Protection and Advocacy Organization to re request help with restoring her rights. Um, initially, though, it was interesting, what I found through um, my readings is the county attorney was not originally comfortable with the request, even though there had been psychological studies and things for um, Suzanne and her team to take forward. Um, so the court did appoint an attorney on Susie's behalf, and as a part of her work in responding to having additional information, this was uh, interesting. She created a, a dream board that she prepared with those in, in her team with um, photos on one side of her supported decision-making team. And on the other side of this board, um, she illustrated um, what they represent or what those people in her team might represent her in hopes for her future. Um, what I can see from the um, activities that took place regarding Suzanne, Susie, was that things moved pretty quickly for her once she had this 
um, dream board available and had her team, you know, supporting her with her efforts. It looked as though things started in 2017 for her and almost, I believe from what I could read, um, the next slide I think tells us a little bit more. It even didn't take more than a few months on the next slide that the judge with the agreement of the county attorney who better understood supported decision making with the use of that dream board uh, fully restored hex rights. And a couple of the key points that I just wanted to share with you in, in my research with regard to, to Susie Hecht's situation is that she was called sort of a Jackie Robinson for restored rights in Kentucky and absolutely was the first person on record to have her rights fully restored uh, with the use of the support of decision making in, as an alternative. And I list there um, a, a reference for you, a, a website for you to read a little bit more if you're interested in that. And I didn't know, Morgan, if you had any additional information that you wished to share. Yeah, so Susie was the first person in Kentucky to have her rights fully restored with supported decision making as an alternative. One of the things I really am impressed by with Susie's case is that it, it demonstrates the way in which interdisciplinary teams can help people um, regard guardianship not as a final destination, uh, destination, but as a way station, as the potential that people can get their rights restored. Because this is a case that was brought, that really demonstrates that it takes a team. So you had the direct support professionals and other people who were supporting Susie um, think that she didn't need to have a guardian. They got her linked in with Susie's um, advocacy, with the protection and advocacy system in Kentucky, which are lawyers. Um, to take the legal steps necessary for it. And then the team worked together to try to develop the evidence necessary to show a judge that guardianship wasn't needed anymore in this case. So this is a success for Susie and it's a success for her team. And it's a model that I would like to see, um, speaking with my quality trust hat on, replicated in more states to realize that guardianship and rights restoration is not just a legal issue. It's an issue that we should all be involved in advocating when we're advocating for people. Um, and we need to recognize that it really does take a team um, to be successful in, in rights restoration cases. So I think it's an excellent example of that um, in this case. Thank you, Morgan. Next slide, please. Um, another, just to keep us engaged a bit, another poll we've put in here after um, having heard what Morgan has shared and a little bit about um, how things are working nationally. The question for us to answer at this point, does supported decision making apply only on an individual level and not to guide an organization or team approach to supporting people? The answer, yes or no. Does it apply only on an individual level. Okay, polling will end in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, um, and I want to thank Morgan. She was uh, sort of teaching to the test or teaching to the Whole, so to speak. So absolutely, it does not solely apply on an individual basis and an individual level, but through organizational and team approaches to supporting people, we absolutely can make it applicable um, for how we practice, how organizations practice, our approach of seeing this as the most, most um, restrictive uh, supporting decision making as the least restrictive supports for people. So thank you for that. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so next slide. I've given you just a bit of a, a notice earlier that I did want to touch on how sort of 
supported decision making does connect with, uh, for those of you who are using personal outcome measures, and then next we'll talk about basic assurances. So I wanted to pick out a couple of the things that you might be familiar with. Um, the two big bulleted points here in our, a copy of our 2017 personal outcome measures manual photo is there for you. But the two that I, I picked out that seem to be the, the, the supported decision making was hard for both personal outcome measures and for basic assurances to select just a few to talk with. But I did want to point out the outcome of people exercising rights, um, the outcome of people are treated fairly as two um, that most specifically and just kind of most logically with regard to what we've been talking about seem to make most sense. Um, I also wanted to make note that we've listed here in the CQL capstone from August of 2018 that there's some information about um, access to personal possessions, including money. But on top of that, I also do want to make note of a CQL webinar that was recently presented that's titled Money, 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 My Rep Payee Manages That. And again, for you to access what those, uh, what that presentation looked like, you can also go to the CQL website, training and certification, webinars, and you should be able to find that titled um, resource for you. Typically, um, rights that are not being exercised uh, without adequate due process or without informed choice with people's having been experienced education and exposed to things, um, they really do lead us to further exploration of the outcome of people being treated fairly. So that's why I kind of wrapped these two together on one slide. So uh, exercising people's rights, I've put in a couple things here just for us to keep present in our minds as we're moving how supported decision making may help us um, think about these things. Representative payees, um, guardianship, and again, I would challenge us to look and see what guardianship is in place. Um, sometimes there are um, guardians over specific pieces of people's lives and unfortunately sometimes that um, one or two pieces uh, sort of gets trickled down into a lot of other people's uh, decisions in their lives. Also exercising people's rights with access to personal possessions including money which is why I made reference to that webinar, money, 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 my rep payee manages that. Um, and again, when there are rights restrictions for people through the personal outcome measures and are talking with people, we do want to look at, as always, any rights restriction viewed as temporary, the role of a human rights committee in due process procedures in looking at is this the least restrictive type of support necessary for a person which absolutely links back to supported decision making. And then once we get a, a handle as to how that looks within our organizations, within our states, how are we promoting system change um, that practices may be currently today in place that restrict or limit people. So that's, that's sort of our challenge as we are looking to apply this model of supported decision making. Next slide, please. Um, for those of you who do use the personal outcome measures, you'll have some awareness about the information gathering piece. For others um, who may not have as much familiarization, we do gather information about these different outcomes. There's a list of 21, but I'm focusing on the two that I referenced in the earlier um, slide on people exercising rights and having fair treatment. Um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, point out for us is as we're continuing to gather information about how these outcome areas are going for people, how are the individualized supports working around these things, is I wanted to point out a couple of them that will really help gather um, good information that uh, promotes rich and informed decision making for um, both people. It provides us a guide as to how we might support people individually. And as we aggregate data or look at practices that 
are in place, how might these things apply to us organizationally? So a couple of the questions here, I, I, you can certainly read them all, but I wanted to highlight one or two of them. How is, this first one, how is the person informed about um, rights of lesser restriction decision-making supports, including uh, supported decision-making? Um, and then jumping down to kind of the, the third bullet, who does the person include in his or her uh, network or team, as Morgan mentioned, when they have concerns or questions regarding the exercise of rights? And it, to me, sounds as though that is crucial as people are moving forward with either um, seeking to not have the most restrictive restriction uh, uh, guardianship placed on them or in restoration of that. Um, the next bullet down is how are people exposed to and supported to access and use an independent review of any personal freedom. So there it pulls in the cycle of adequate due process of a human rights committee of those third party objective views to really say, well, how have we proven that the lesser types of supports are not going to be effective for people? And then this last question here is organizationally, how do we provide people with training or supports so that limitations can be reversed, removed, or lessened? So those are some things that will, I think if we couch those as we're talking with people in the use of the personal outcome measures, as we're talking to those who support individuals, as we're looking at organizational practices, to try to keep those um, front and center for you, um, and that may give you some air avenues to explore as you as you look toward. Well, how do we really want to apply this model of supported decision making? All right, next slide, please. Um, some of the other personal outcome measures that this very much for me linked personally to and professionally is really about cho choice. We've talked about self-determination. We've talked about the same liberties that all citizens exercise and absolutely people choosing where and with whom they want to live. Um, unfortunately, through my conversations with people and with organizations using the personal outcome measures, um, even though this may be disappearing, it is still very much in existence that people who are needing support uh, for their residents are found placements, are placed into openings, are designed that there's a slot there so that person might be asked to live with someone else. And remember um, that this outcome talks about and the with whom and the with whom. So when we're applying this to talking with people and learning about what supports are available and in place for people, um, what about the right to say no, to say no to, I don't want to move, or to say no to, I don't want this person to move into my home with me, or to say no, I don't wish to share my bathroom or bedroom with this person. So all of these things uh, absolutely link very closely to um, the use of the personal outcome measures and supported decision making. Another outcome here is, you can see it's listed as people choose uh, services. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that um, on the next page. So Kathy, if you could move me forward, thank you. And again, some potential information gathering. Again, these may need to be customized for those of you who use the personal outcome measures tool as a way to talk with people, but even if you don't, to talk with people about what their um, uh, choices have been, what their experience has been. And the first one here is, how is the person and his or her team informed about options, including generic non-disability community settings or services, which for any of us who've been involved in the recent um, requirements coming out through the HCBS waiver, this is language from the federal side that is also being expected. Um, what has been the person's education experience and exposure about those options? And I just wanted to apply that a little bit to 
the choice of uh, banking services or financial services that I uh, kind of previewed on the previous page. So let's, let's just consider banking services or our financial services. How, how are people being formed about um, all of the different options that people have with regard to financial services for banks? That uh, are people informed about automatic deposits? Some banks give you a, uh, you know, they give you free checking or free additional services if you have an automatic deposit. Um, how some, some banks, as we're opening up bank accounts, will offer you free, free credit card services. Some have better online banking services than others. Um, is there a need that a person might want to have a, a personal financial advisor or consultant through the banking services? Are people interested in more local banking services, such as credit unions and what those types of financial services offer? How are people informed about what fees might be involved in that? So, um, just to apply some of these information gathering questions to just that one service for people and kind of going back to the representative payee issue, as we're linking those things together and talking about, well, gosh, it is a, potentially a restriction to have people's monies being managed by some other payee. How are we moving these things forward with people and who may have had very limited exposure or life experiences to help, to help inform them? Um, in, in supported decision making, how would the person and his or her team begin to explore this? Um, whose, uh, whose opinions do we pull in? What, what team members have more expertise in this? Who in my family or friend network has more expertise in this? Who knows me and knows what might be things that would be helpful to me? Um, what do we need to begin to research? Um, what do we really want to support the person to get out and touch and feel and see? So those are all things that as we're applying that to um, the model of supported decision making, just in that one outcome of people choosing services, Lots of different things to consider and with the team approach, with people who have had limited life experiences, how can we um, ensure that we're providing that the, the persons or people that we are um, a team member of this information. Next slide, please. Supported decision and the basic assurances. We've left the personal outcome measures tool um, that CQL has and now have moved into the tool of basic assurances. And what I have to say about my preparing for this um, webinar, it was really difficult for me to hone in and um, knuckle down to just a few things to talk with us about here because for me, supported decision making really plays out in um, organizational alignment on almost all of the basic assurances. So having said that, though, we don't have um, all day to talk through that, but I did want to point out a couple of the factors in the basic assurances. And again, for those of you who may have an awareness of this, there's <clears throat> basic assurances, 10 different basic assurances. Um, and for organizations that are uh, looking to align with things that support ensuring that organizational practices and structures are there to support people. This is one tool that CQL offers um, in, in our partnership with organizations. So the first factor sort of makes sense, rights protection and promotion. There's a couple indicators here that more particularly were more easily applicable to me for the supported decision-making um, model. Uh, <clears throat> Um, you can see here, excuse me, I just need to. For organizations to really take a look at and peel back, do our policies and procedures promote people's rights? Um, and that these procedures are described and how individual rights and documentation are reviewed. So I know it may not only be something we want to culturally talk about, but there are also, and we're going to share, I'm going to share with you maybe where you can find some tools for this um, at the end of the webinar. Uh, indicator E under this factor is decision-making supports are provided to people as needed, which means that 
we've really talked with and assessed the need for guardianship advocacy, uh, representative payee, and alternatives to those. So that would absolutely include how are we kind of testing the limits of how do we know that supported decision making? And it was great to hear through Morgan's portion of this that even courts are kind of taking that, that look, that they're determining, which is the, the third probe here, determining the scope of what people need in decision making supports. Um, and absolutely, as you're, as I know, we're all within uh, agencies or organizations, certainly some type of person center plan or documentation would be needed. So that would be a great way to document how all of our efforts as the person is moving toward um, full rights um, exercising, uh, that we can show where this is taking place. Not necessarily that it has to be in a plan, but that it's something that you could do, which, yes, Kathy, perfect. The next slide. Um, as we're talking about and gathering um, information about that factor, um, what are some of the things that you might want to look at? Um, and what rights are restricted? So that takes us for a, as an organization or those that are involved in service networks for people. What might be some things based on previous models, not that anyone is doing anything um, and intentionally incorrect or not in full promotion of rights, but some of the models on which we were built may not have been all about uh, finding the least restrictive method to support people. A um, little bit about how are the human rights committees functioning in the restoration of people's rights. And one of the questions we do like to ask when we do talk to organizations about their human rights committee, how many of the human rights committees are actually looking at those people who have either guardianship or representative payee and are beginning to say, well, gosh, we see this as a full restriction. How are we supporting the person to lessen that? So those are all things and, and inclusive of a third party people involved in that. All of those things would be um, things for organizations to look at in fact one. As we move on to um, the next slide with basic assurances, um, factor two about dignity and respect. And again, I have to um, couch this in saying it was really difficult for me to find just a couple of the factors to um, highlight for us today. But this one, of course, factor two being dig dignity and um, respect. Again, as we test our supports internally and um, organizationally and culturally, are we really testing them against um, the, the model of supported decision making? Uh, might we find areas for opportunity to support achieving people are treated as people first? Um, that supports and services enhance dignity and respect for people. So let's, let's be mindful um, again of Sorry, the tenets of what the UN Convention on Rights of Peoples with Disabilities is, is moving from viewing people as objects of charity or social protection or um, needing medical uh, protection to moving toward people, people capable of claiming their rights and making decisions based on free and informed consent. So as we move to some of the questions on the next slide, Kathy, <coughs> potential information gathering for agencies aligning themselves or looking to see, well, gosh, how do the basic assurances, what we do as an organization, what we support people with and looking at dignity and respect for people, these might be questions that we might ask ourselves. Um, and just really the challenges here in, in some of the self-reflection organizationally on practices, systems, and values. May we want to reflect more fully on allowing ourselves to be on the person versus organizational systems, practices, and um, uh, those models, which may not be all about efforts that support lesser, least restrictive, team approach to supporting people. So thank you for that, Kathy. Next slide. <clears throat> I had mentioned that one of our uh, 
uh, topics for today was going to talk a little bit about advocacy, and I know that in all, in many states, you have advocacy protection groups, even within certain counties, there might be advocacy groups. I know that the um, Quality Trust can certainly, and through Morgan's um, uh, presentation earlier, she recommended that you connect with and know about what the supported decision-making efforts are within your own state. Um, according to the Berkeley Center for Independent Living, these are some of the core values of what advocacy, role of advocacy is all about. Um, dignity, dignity for people, peer support, uh, consumer control, activism, advocacy support. And I, I wanna thank Kathy for putting in this picture here on this slide. And <clears throat> for me, what stands out is in advocates, in advocacy movements, the my, the my meeting, my team, my control, as we're moving toward the model of supported decision making, that just becomes um, part of who we are all about versus others setting people's meetings, others providing support decisions, others helping to design uh, people's dreams or what amount of control people have. So thank you. Next slide, please. <coughs> This sort of goes without saying and how it links very much back to um, the <clears throat> model of supported decision making. Um, for some people also who uh, we've met in our work with people using the personal outcome measures and working with organizations who use the basic assurances to align their core values and core structure to things. One of the um, uncomfortable things that we find from some of our conversations with people is that people have been in older models of support, have learned to be quite compliant um, versus taking an active role in leading and an active role in advocating, so advocating for themselves. So sometimes it might really take for us to take a look back and say, how are we supporting people who may have had compliance-based models in their living or work um, or in their support system to be uh, to, to kind of turn that over and flip that on its head versus people deciding what is mine, what is important to me. So just wanted to keep that in the in the back of your head as you're rolling these things out or beginning to talk about them within your agency and <clears throat> for the people that you support, that compliance piece of people who we really would like to take on their lead role in advocating for themselves may not be as um, easily achieved based on some maybe limited life experiences. Next slide, please. Um, I, I received some nice help as Morgan and I were setting this up from Morgan um, about this, I do want to refer to the um, National Council on Disability publication here. All of the information on this slide and the next couple slides comes from um, their report. So the National Council on Disability report refers to school to guardianship pipeline. And we touched upon that a little bit earlier that many families or those who are the older youth and those systems that are involved in that family or young adults life may have limited awareness about alternatives to guardianship. So what they found and what I'm quoting here is all parents have fears about whether their teenager will be ready for the responsibilities of adulthood when they turn 18, but it is only the parents of teenagers with disabilities who are regularly advised that they have the option of preventing the child from becoming uh, legally an adult in the eyes of the world. So um, what their findings were is guardianship is um, most often uh, the first choice for families versus the last resort. And um, what they are also finding in their report on the uh, National Council on Disability publication is that they also found that regardless of who made the first uh, who, 
regardless of who made first the recommendation, plenty, plenary guardianship and power of attorney are the most often recommended. So it was great that Morgan made reference to the American Bar Association and um, there is a resource that through Quality Trust they can you can link to. So if you're working with um, attorneys, they, we do have some sources for you on that. Next slide, please. Um, and so that you have some information on, on hand, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, as Morgan mentioned, some states' efforts on um, alternatives to guardianship through your developmental disability councils. I was able to find just a few, but Morgan has mentioned more in Virginia, Wisconsin, and Florida. I did want to point out in the publication that I'm referencing from the National Council on Disability is they did talk a bit about, they did quite an in-depth study in the cost of justice, so to speak, and they did put this in quotes, was for guardianship in their national research, they found that the cost of guardianship ranges anywhere from $1,500 to $5,000. Um, and then they also saw, uh, found that for more public or formal guardians, they can bill for services. And some of those services, uh, the fees can range anywhere between $15, $15 and $125 per hour. What they did make note of those that family members are not typically or not generally compensated for their time other than billing for some other types of things like services if they're paying for people's bills. Um, public guardianship, um, just wanted to make reference to their findings here. In 20, uh, 2007, they found that 32 States used social services agencies as the model for public guardianship. It was noted <clears throat> at that time that, um, that of the public guardian programs, the majority are housed within social service agencies. Um, so the question that they raised was, how can then the public guardian objectively assess services or bring lawsuits against the agency on behalf of the person if they are the guardian. So it was, it was quite interesting. It was um, quite an interesting conundrum uh, if the social service agency is identified as the, as the public guardian, but yet they are also the uh, provider of choice for the person of services. So it posed a bit of a dilemma. Next slide, please. Um, and as Morgan mentioned, states do provide a means to terminate guardianship and restore rights. Of course, it varies from state to state. Um, the, this publication from the National Council on Disability also mentioned that there's limited data and information on the frequency or circumstances that the surround restoration of people's rights. They did identify um, some issues that are pertinent with regard to restoration, that um, people have an awareness of restoration option, that people are informed and have access to courts, that they have right to counsel, and that the role of the counsel is a zealot advocate, not purely a guardian ad, ad litem. Um, the focus is on supports and alternatives to guardianship and that team approach, and then the, the role of the guardian. Next slide, please. I would just say with that piece of it that the National sure. Council on Disability Report, which Quality Trust was involved in, was really identifying here barriers, barriers to restoration, the fact that there, people weren't aware of the restoration option, that their council that were appointed did not represent what their interests were, instead looked at it from a purely best interest kind of perspective. Um, so they really identify these barriers to accessing restoration. And it just kind of highlights what a serious step it is to take a guardianship case in the sense that it's far harder to get out from under a guardianship than to divert unnecessary guardianship. So that was a point for the National Council on Disability Report. Thank you, Morgan. Next slide, please. Um, I 
put up for you here an, an example of um, that recently came out of, or at least that I became aware of from the state of Delaware. And I've listed um, the website there. Um, lots of information here on the page, a lot of narrative, but really what I would like to focus on is the state of Delaware came up with and developed what they have titled a supported decision-making agreement form. Um, and what I find was um, very interesting here was that it was there was a declarative statement at the beginning of this form that this is being used to help appoint persons to help people make decisions. And then like immediately after that in this agreement form in bold, highlighted, underlined language, it says, my appointed person or persons does not make decisions for me. The form actually goes on to identify those team members or people, areas of support for health decisions, areas of support for services and for finances. And then it also very clearly specified in that making agreement form, which I found very cool, is areas where I do not want supported decision makers or my team to help me. So it was very clear within that agreement form. And I think it falls kind of back in line too with what Morgan was saying is that in the example we were talking about earlier is that that team approach was very important as I think it was Susie was moving forward in her restoration of her rights. So that this is another, just another document, another tool for you to have. And I would uh, you know, encourage you to look at what supported decision-making um, form is up there on the State of Delaware website. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, American Bar Association practical steps and supported decision making. I really, with Morgan on the call here, feel quite uh, honored if I might ask her to kind of talk in and talk you through what these steps to lesser restrictive um, options are for people. Morgan, would you mind? I apologize. I didn't ask you this ahead of time. Sure. Um, so the American Bar Association has come up with an, a tool for lawyers to try to encourage the exhaustion of less restrictive alternatives before moving towards guardianship. And I think that this tool is useful because even though it's made for lawyers, you can use these kinds of concepts um, even if you're not a lawyer. So for example, it's been adapted for social workers in Minnesota. So there's some knowledge about, it just kind of starts you thinking down the line. So the first thing you do, um, you, it, it, the acronym is practical. Um, and you first presume guardianship isn't necessary. So this is really kind of starting from a place where the, the lawyer is assuming at the outset that there may be less restrictive alternatives that can, can really uh, address the person's individual needs. And then you look to the reason. This is the question I always ask. When someone calls me and says, Morgan, I want to get guardianship, I always ask them why. Because sometimes guardianship is the right tool, but sometimes it's not the right tool. So you always ask why first. And so you're saying, what is the reason behind this concern um, or the need for some kind of intervention or the feel that there needs to be a guardianship? And then you ask yourself whether or not the concern is caused by a temporary or reversible condition. So is the concern um, something that is uh, basically permanent or does it have to do with, for example, um, a certain kind of crisis that's in place right now, um, perhaps with finances, perhaps with housing? Um, those aren't necessarily permanent kinds of conditions. Moreover, is, the, is it, it actually asks you to look at the person's disability and to see whether or not their disability is a temporary or reversible condition. Um, and I'm going through this fairly quickly just because I know we're kind of in nearing the end of our webinar, we want to make sure we have enough questions, but it you really, it kind of encourages you to ask yourself these kinds of questions about the actual reason um, for why you're getting guardianship. And then C is for community, and I think this is probably one of the most important things. This really encourages people to stop for a second and says, will the issue that's being right, that, that's arisen, that's the need for guardianship or kind of prompting that need for some kind of intervention, could it be addressed by connecting the person to family or community resources? I find this issue is an issue a lot. Like somebody, for example, is having problems 
accessing adult services or accessing certain services under a waiver. And I, they say to me, oh, well, they need a guardian. I said, no, they really need supports and services. So can the issue that is kind of arising to this conversation be addressed through kind of links to the community? Um, the team uh, for T, that really says who is going to be on the person's team. Does the person already have a team and it is the right team for them to support decisions? If they don't have a team, how can we help them build a team? Um, so that's really what the T stands for. The I stands for identifying abilities. And this is really encouraging people to look not only at the, what are perceived as the weaknesses of the person, but what their strengths are potentially in other kinds of areas. Um, and so this is about really trying to get us to shift the idea from seeing people only as having needs to having strengths. C is for challenges. So this is where you're really screening for, are there any potential challenges here um, in identifying, for example, supports and supporters. Um, and A is for a point. So it encourages a lawyer to try to examine whether the person is able to voluntarily appoint someone to either support them as a supporter, to support them as an agent under a power of attorney, or through some other kind of mechanism. So it looks to voluntary um, appointment of the person. And within L, where guardianship is seen to be needed, you limit the guardianship um, to the greatest extent that you can um, while still meeting the per person's needs. So I think this kind of is, um, if, if you actually go to the American Bar website, you can see a checklist. And it encourages people to really look closely um, before recommending guardianship. So I think it's a very useful tool, not only for lawyers, um, but uh, for other kinds of practitioners. And I think it's, it's great that it has the AOK -okay from the American Bar Association. Um, it gives some credence to really thinking through um, less restrictive alternatives. And I want to thank you, Morgan. I, as an as a uh, you know an attorney and as the you know the expert in the fields, thank you for. I would have not even gotten close to your your uh, uh, explanation. So thank you for that. Um, next slide, please. I think through um, the course of what we've been talking about today, the benefits of supported decision making really do have a um, you know an all around uh, structure in supporting people with you know, a better quality of life. And that's really why uh, most people and most organizations are in, in what we're doing, what we do. Next slide. The next slide is gonna take us through a, another quick poll. Uh, the question in front of us is, is pursuing and restoring rights through supported decision-making easily achieved and clearly defined in all states, yes or no? We'll stop polling in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, and the, and the majority of um, the respondents are certainly seeing that uh, through different states, different uh, support systems, we will need to connect with and uh, within each of your states uh, can find where you might find the best information, connecting with your advocacy groups. And as was mentioned earlier, Quality Trust and uh, Morgan and the uh, Jenny Hatch uh, project absolutely can provide you with where your states are. So next, we're gonna turn this over to Morgan and she's gonna provide um, a bit more information on another success story. Um, and I'll pass it over to Morgan. So when I asked, you know, why promote supported decision making, you know, I can point to the studies after studies that have been done that have said people who have greater self-determination in their lives have better life outcomes. They're healthier, um, they're happier, they're more likely to live in the community. Um, so I can point to all those studies, but I think the much more powerful 
story is the story of people themselves. Um, and so I always think about Ryan uh, and Ryan's King story. Um, I and Quality Trust helped him get his rights restored after 15 years of being subject to guardianship. Um, and you can find more about Ryan's story by visiting supporteddecisionmaking.org at this link. But I always think about Ryan and how he described what decision making meant to him. Um, and he said, you know, don't judge me before you know me. Now, Ryan's a very powerful self-advocate in the District of Columbia, and he, um, you know, he's part of a Project Action, which is a self-advocacy organization for people with developmental disabilities. They testify um, before um, the D.C. Council about laws, and they, they educate lawmakers about what's important, important to them. They educate policymakers. And when you meet Ryan, you know he's a really powerful advocate. And he said, you know, just because I'm, he's basically saying, I'm not my disability, I'm a person. So don't judge me till you know me. And this is something that he, in fact, told a judge um, who was maybe um, being presented with certain kinds of um, presumptions about what Ryan could or couldn't do. And to Ryan, decision making was a big piece of his life. I also think that his father, um, Herb, said it really powerfully as well. Um, he said, Ryan is a whole person. We want him to be whole. The decision process is part of being whole. If I try to force Ryan to do something, I'm destroying his selfness and being whole. He is a whole person and he is making his decisions and I encourage him. I think that's such a powerful testament that decision making is part of what it means to be a person. And so we need to recognize that when we work with people with disabilities. And when we think about the balancing of the risks that are involved with living with what personal dignity means. So that's for me really the why of supportive decision making. Next slide. So Ryan was, uh, I would say, a victim of um, the school to guardianship pipeline that we referenced before, um, that Anne referenced when she was talking about the National Council on Disability Report. Because when Ryan turned 18, his parents were told they had to become his guardian in order for him to access services in the District of Columbia. Now, that's not true. But that's what they were told. And they didn't think he needed to have a guardian. They supported him in making his own decisions. It was a very loving household that really pushed, put a premium on uh, people exercising and building their skills over time. Um, but they did want him to be able to access services. Okay, he had dreams. He has dreams in his life. You know, he, he wants to be an entrepreneur. He really wants to own a limo business. And so they didn't want to, but they went and they went to go get guardianship. And then they realized, the family realized what a restriction it really was in his life. It was more than just a piece of paper. The court was really overseeing a lot of aspects of Ryan's life um, with court reports having to be due and the constant threat that if court reports weren't filed in time, that they, family members would be removed as his guardian and there could be a stranger guardian appointed. So in 2007, they went back to court to try to get the guardianship removed. And ultimately the judge said no at that time. And, and Ryan's own attorney argued against what Ryan wanted. So it took, it wasn't until 2016 where really got through help of the Quality Trust and the Burton Blatt Institute where Ryan tried again and presented evidence of his ability to make decisions and direct his own life using supported decision making. And this time the judge agreed and restored Ryan's rights. But let's think about that, 15 years under guardianship for Ryan. Um, so this was the first case in D.C. where guardianship was terminated in favor of supported decision making. And I tell Ryan's story because I think it highlights something, that families are eager for information about what alternatives can be, or they can be educated about what those kinds of alternatives are. It also highlights that it's a lot harder to get out from under a guardianship if you've already been adjudicated as needing to have a guardian. And so you can find more stories and actually more excitingly um, videos of Ryan, Ryan's own story and him telling his own story, as well as his parents telling his own story here. And it's a very powerful one for us all to keep in mind in advancing supported decision making. Next slide. Um, we do not have time for this today, but another impactful story is the story of Jamie Beck. And I've listed um, just a website here to get some information with regard to Jamie, another example, a successful example. Next slide, please. And, and her case is in Indiana. Okay. So we're all parts of many different parts of the United States. That, that's excellent. 
for um, us, one of the things that I would like to leave with you as participants on the call today is a, is a challenge. Um, and I put it up here in, in the format for us to take with us. When guardianship discussions take place within your organization for people and or for your organizational practices or principles, the challenge that I'd like to place in front of you is to please attempt to at least begin dialogue around and raise awareness of supportive decision making. So that is my, my challenge for those of you who are on the, the call today and, and hope that you're able to, with a bit more information from today's webinar, move forward with that. Quality slide, Trust, uh, Morgan, there's a lot of different resources out there. Um, the next couple slides that we want to go to um, are in reference to some of the resources. Kathy, I wonder, I'm still showing the poll resort results from the last one um, on my screen. But we, what we've done here for the next couple pages is give you some supported decision-making tools. Um, Morgan has made reference to a couple of them already, the National Council on Disability, uh, supporteddecisionmaking.org, sdaus.com, learning community. There's a, another page, I think, with resources on it following Kathy. Um, again, going back to our CQL website, we've got some more information on the personal outcome measures, the HCBS rule. Uh, so you can certainly look up those for additional supported decision making tools. And then um, the next slide, I think Morgan wanted to share some tools as well. So I want to encourage people to take a look at some of our archived webinars on the supporteddecisionmaking.org website because we've had webinar topics including implementing supported decision making in education and community-based supports and financial decisions. It can be a really good resource for you. There are transcripts, slides, and video recordings that are available there um, at that particular link. The second piece I would say is that I like to emphasize that there are guides on supported decision making, and they're brainstorming guides, um, and there's two that I really highlight. One is a kind of brainstorming guide across the lifespan, and the other, the team setting the wheel in motion one, is focused on transition age youth. So it kind of gives people a starting point for how to have these conversations about supported decision making. Because one of the things that I'll emphasize is supported decision making isn't just one thing. It's gonna look different for different people and you're gonna approach it differently for different people. So these are kind of focus a little bit on how some of the ways of actually getting concrete about how to use supported decision making in people's lives. Next slide. And again, uh, through CQL, we do offer some additional resources, um, some training options. There's a one day uh, training that is offered on supportive decision making training. And I know we're getting to our time here. So I just wanted to share that with you. And on the next slide, give a wonderful, huge thank you to um, our speaker, Morgan Whitlatch. I just cannot say how much I am honored to have been on the, the webinar with her. Feel uh, free to be in touch with either me or her if there are additional questions. Um, and I know we had a few questions that came up in our question box. I wonder, Kathy, if we may need to take those individually. Well, I think probably we'll just need to respond in our email that we send out because we're we're so we're over our time. So um, we'll look at the questions, see that we can respond. Many of them are comments or. Um, you know, some updates for um, different things that are happening in organizations. So we'll share those with you when we send out the uh, recorded webinar. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Anne. I really appreciate both you and Morgan's time and all of our wonderful um, um, partners who have participated in the webinar. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.